Hi guys, Harps and Harps here. Today we're going to be looking at the literal origins of the Paladin and the Bard, what they were influenced by, and the history of why we use those names in Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, let's go. The Paladin class first appeared in 1976 within Greyhawk, and they were initially a subclass of the Fighting Man. Fight. However, the prerequisite to be able to play as a Paladin was that you had to be of Lawful Alignment, and back in the original D&D, there were only three alignments. Lawful, Chaotic, and Neutral. Therefore, the requirement to be Lawful immediately cemented the class into the White Knight archetype. The English word Paladin dates back to 1592, where, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, it appeared in Samuel Daniel's sonnet entitled Delia, Let Others Sing of Knights and Paladins. Samuel Daniel was an English poet, playwright, and historian, and he influenced later authors like William Wordsworth and C.S. Lewis, who described Daniel as the most interesting man of letters and the most interesting man of letters he may have been, but it would be wrong to give credit to Samuel for the word, as this was simply its earliest use in the English language. Having entered through Middle French, its actual origins came from the Latin word palatinus, and paladino became used in 13th century Italian to refer to 12 fictional knights of Charlemagne's court that first started to appear in the French Chassons de Geste. <laughs> which translates from Old French into Songs of Heroic Deeds, the most famous of which is the Song of Roland, which details Charlemagne's battle against Muslims in Spain. It is in these fictitious songs and epic poems where paladins became associated with holy warriors, and which almost a thousand years later inspired a novel called Three Hearts and Three Lions by Paul Anderson in 1961. It was this novel that, according to Literary Sources of D&D by Ardy Duvark, inspired Gary Gygax to create the D&D version of The Paladin. The plot of the novel is strange, but it goes roughly as follows. Holger Carlsen, a Danish engineer, joins the resistance against the Nazis in World War II. Whilst trying to assist a Danish scientist, Niels Bohr, with escaping the country, he is shot by a German soldier and transported to a parallel universe, where the matters of France, which are legends about Charlemagne, are real. The world he finds himself in is inhabited by the forces of chaos and the forces of law. He finds the equipment of a medieval knight waiting for him upon arrival, including a horse, a shield emblazoned with three hearts and three lions, and he is also able to automatically speak a very archaic form of French. <laughs> Holger sets out on an adventure to return to his home world, and in the process recovers the legendary sword known as Cortana, whereby he vanquishes the forces of chaos and realizes that he is one of the legendary paladins, Ogier the Dane, a fictional character that featured in many of the songs of heroic deeds. Upon returning to his own world, he goes back to where he was shot and vanquishes the Nazis with a superhuman strength. Sounds f epic. Anyway, there are several traits of Holger that were clearly influential to the Paladin class, the first being that he fought for the forces of law against chaos, which also influenced D&D's early alignment system, and the second being that Holger also developed healing powers in this parallel world, which are now a staple of paladins in D&D. On a side note, the novel also influenced D&D's trolls, as when Holger comes across one in the parallel version of Europe, it has the ability to regenerate. In 2005, Gary Gygax did an AMA on dragonsfoot.org regarding paladins. Let's take a look at what the creator of D&D has to say about them. Paladins are not stupid, and in general there is no rule of lawful good against killing enemies. The old adage about nits making lice applies. Also, as I have often noted, a paladin can freely dispatch prisoners of evil alignment that have surrendered and renounced that alignment in favour of lawful good. They are then sent on to their reward before they can backslide. Nits make lice, historically, is a phrase that has been associated with exterminating members of a community before they themselves inevitably become your enemy. I guess in the case of the paladin, Gary is implying that in his view of lawful good, a paladin that executes people without a trial would be perfectly acceptable if, within the confines of their society, it is lawful for a paladin to do so, and if the person they are fighting against is evil. Anyway, I've linked an interesting discussion on Reddit regarding this AMA and Gary's thoughts on the paladin down below, because now it is time to talk about something completely different. According to the Evolution of Fantasy Role-Playing Games by Michael Tresca, the term bard is of Celtic origin, descended from the old Celtic term bardo, 
When the word was introduced into English, its meaning became that of a strolling minstrel. Toss a coin to your in Of Dice and Men, the story of Dungeons and Dragons, David Ewalt describes the bard as akin to the Pied Piper. But when the bard class was first introduced in Strategic Review magazine, February 1976, it states that the bard is a mix of at least three different kinds of musical singers. The Norse Skald, the Celtic Bard, and the Southern European Minstrel. However, it was the Celtic bards that were more integrated into their society, and whilst druids were typical of a priest caste in this society, bards filled the important role of historian. During the pre-Christian era in Celtic society, there was an intricate oral history kept by bards who memorized the material by using rhythmic poetic styles. The original creator of the D&D bard, Doug Schwegman, stated that his bard is based on the Celtic and Nordic versions rather than the Southern European minstrels who he describes as being more as entertainers, that resided in the courts of princes and kings within Germany, Italy and France. These individuals were known as junglers, <laughs> and it is where we get terms like jester and juggler today. Doug describes them as less trustworthy than their Celtic counterparts, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, but these are Doug's words, and he was inspired by the idea that bards from Northern Europe in Celtic and Norse society were better trained and more reliable. The reason Doug didn't base the bard too much on the minstrels of Southern Europe was that he wanted the class to act more like a fighter, as we can see here. I have fashioned the character more after the Celtic and Norse types than anything else. Thus, he is a character who resembles a fighter more than anything else, but who knows something about the mysterious forces of magic and is well adept with his hands, etc. It seems that Doug wasn't entirely inspired by ancient history though, and he does make reference to J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, where it is known that Tolkien was heavily influenced by Norse mythology. And Doug specifically mentions Bilbo's chant of Arendelle the Marina in his article about bards. Now, when the bard was first introduced, it was a class on its own, and interestingly, dwarves, halflings, then known as hobbits, and elves could only reach level 8 within it. But at the advent of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, it became a far more complex class that had a lot of prerequisites, as well as being limited only to humans and half-elves. Let's take a look at it in the first AD&D Player's Handbook. Bards begin play as fighters and they must remain exclusively fighters until they have achieved at least the fifth level of experience. Any time thereafter, and in any event prior to attaining the eighth level, they must change their class to that of thieves. Again, sometime between fifth and ninth level of ability, bards must leave off thieving and begin clerical studies as druids. But at this time, they are actually bards and under druidical tutelage. After that, you can then advance to the bard table, where you'll gain levels in that class. Yes, it was complicated, but there was likely a reason behind this, given that the book further explains that a bard always engages in combat at the level he or she attained as a fighter. A bard was seen as an immensely well-trained individual. Due to training, a bard has knowledge of many legendary and magical items, and in AD&D, they were visibly more reminiscent of the highly trained and respected bards of Celtic and Norse culture, rather than simple travelling minstrels who were often depicted as roguish in nature within 5th edition. Personally, I prefer the level of depth that bards had in AD&D, but I'm of course happy that the class opened up within the rules themselves. Anyway, thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, then do please give me a like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye!